Welcome to Calvary, everyone. I'm Steph. It's wonderful to be with you as we gather to worship the Lord, to connect with one another, and to learn from the Word together. Last week, many of you filled out the online survey that we asked you to take for Calvary Online as we seek to figure out who our online community is and better ways that we can serve you. Thank you so much to all of you who filled that out. We want to let you know that that survey is available still. And if you didn't have an opportunity to take it, hit pause on the video now and go to calvarybible.com slash survey, fill that out so that we can know better how to serve you, who you are, and continue to grow our online community. We're thankful for you. And we're thankful that we gather to worship the Lord. Let's take a moment now to pause, prepare our hearts for worship, and enter this holy moment where we set aside what's happening in our life and come before the Father together. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger in darkness, new every morning, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. Without bottom or shore Our sins, they are many His mercy is more Praise the Lord His mercy is more
Jesus, we thank you for your mercy. God, we thank you that our sins are many. But God, no matter what, your mercy is always more. So God, as we just dive into your words of truth, I pray, God, I pray that you fill us with your mercy, that you fill us with your love. And God, that we would lay everything at your feet and trust that you forgive, that you redeem, God, that you free. It's in your holy and precious name that we pray these things. Amen. Today we're going to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, which is Paul's conclusion of the letter to this church in Thessalonica, a church that had issues not unlike our own day. We have issues in our life, and Paul's writing to them for instruction. At the end of last week, chapter 3 and verse 12, Paul said, May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. He said everything we do is rooted on growing in love, becoming people who, like him, are filled with love for each other, for others, for God himself. And now we're going to get to the conclusion, how does that love for each other manifest itself in the way we live. Paul begins verse 1 of chapter 4, finally then, brothers, we ask you and we urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through our Lord Jesus Christ. The verse begins with the word finally. And in classic Paul style, he has two chapters of final instructions. He's only given three so far, and the finally is two whole chapters. That's where every preacher got the phrase, in conclusion, whenever a preacher says that, you know, you may not be concluding quite yet. But Paul says, finally. And the word finally is, I think, the summary of everything that's come in the first three chapters is going to be laid out with some specific contextual applications for them. And you'll see in verse one, I circled this in my journal. You heard from us, you received information from us, how you ought to walk, which is Paul's language of how you live your life, and to please God just as you're doing. The final words from Paul is to set up the church to know how to live their life to please God, to please him in all that they do. I love that. And that really is the focus of this message this morning. How do we live our life to please God? You remember perhaps in John chapter 8 that Jesus said, I always do the things that are pleasing to my father. And Paul himself said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we have learned that whether we're at home in the body or we're away from the body, we always set as our ambition to please God. In another place, he said, whether you eat or whether you drink, if you're having a meal, if you're out anywhere, make it your ambition to glorify God. That's our calling as God's people, to do all that we do to please him. Um, In Ephesians 5, Paul said, you should find out what pleases the Lord. The whole orientation of our life, ideally, is that we please the Lord. Someone made an illustration of uh, some new recruits coming to military service and their first meeting with their drill sergeant. We've probably seen this conveyed in movies before, but you see this whole band of new recruits standing before a drill sergeant who's walking up and down in front of the line, looking them all over. And he turns and he says to them, you're mine now. And it's like every recruit is saying, oh no, everything I do is for him. 
for military service. And there is a sense in which without the fear and intimidation and the threats, there is a sense that we, having come to Christ, are now his. We belong to him because we've come to know him by faith. And he's not that crazy drill sergeant. He's meek and lowly and humble. And he says, you're mine. And so it makes perfect sense that we would live our life to please him in all respects. That's the finally where Paul is moving to say to this church, let's live our life to please the Lord. You'll see in the verse, it also says you're doing it, but do it more and more as if to convey without mistake that the Christian life and experience is developmental. We're all growing. We are not today what we used to be, but we are not yet what we will be because he's helping us to grow still more and more. The Christian life is developmental. We grow in grace and we strive for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So Paul is moving them to really have in their mind how to please the Lord, which does, of course, beg the question, how do you do that? How do you please the Lord? And so we go to verse 3, and verse 3 is going to begin to unfold a category of life in which pleasing the Lord is seen or not seen. Now, in particular, this next paragraph deals with our sexuality, our life as sexual beings before God. And I want to take a moment and speak to those who perhaps there's children in the room And I hope that what we'll say in what the Bible preaches here clearly will be a reinforcement for what every mom and dad is doing at home with their kids. And what you're doing at home will be reinforced by what we teach in the church. We're simply going to open the Bible and say, what does it say? And I might add that every young person, every child, every teenager needs to know what God says explicitly in his word about sexual life. And I'm glad that the Bible actually gives it to us straight up, simple, direct, and clear. And so that's what we're going to be talking about. There's another group listening to me today. Many of us have had experiences of brokenness in the area of our sexual life. I want you to listen clearly to what the Bible teaches. It doesn't condemn. It calls every follower of Jesus to turn our life to please God in every domain of our life, including our sexual life. So here it is. I'm thankful that the Bible speaks explicitly, and clearly, and compassionately to call people who have said to God, I belong to you, and he says to us, you belong to me, please the living God, that now we're going to find some instruction on just how to do that. So verse 3 says, how do we please God? Verse 3 begins, this is the will of God, your sanctification. This is what pleases God, Your sanctification. The word sanctification is a word that is loaded to convey the idea of something being set apart, put in a special category, sanctified to the Lord. It is the will of God that everyone who belongs to him would be more and more sanctified, set apart for his purposes. What it denotes is the process of being given to God, set apart for God. Once we did not belong to God, now we do. We do belong to God by the event of our coming to Christ and believing in him, becoming a Christian, being regenerated, being born again, and then it sets in motion the whole process of our life of being increasingly changed into the likeness of Jesus. That is a process 
activated by the Holy Spirit in the life of someone who belongs to him. That process is called sanctification. It pleases God that his people increasingly be conformed to the image of his son. You may remember this text from Romans chapter 8, in which the apostle Paul, Romans 8 verse 29, for those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Those whom God saves, he he has in mind their conformity to his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he called. And those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he glorified. In other words, the whole experience of becoming a Christian is in the mind of God to conform his people increasingly to the image of Christ. He is committed to doing that in our lives, perhaps even more than we are. But it's going to happen. Those whom he justified, he's going to glorify. He's going to transform us. First John 3, John said, we're going to be like him. We're going to see him as he is. That's going to happen. So in our life, verse 3 of 1 Thessalonians 4, it is the will of God that we would be sanctified, that we would be increasingly like him. You're in 1 Thessalonians. Just turn the page to chapter 5. And there, Paul puts it in another way as he concludes the real conclusion, verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. God is committed to our sanctification, our progress into the likeness of Christ. And all through life, we go through these experiences in which we stumble in many ways, and then we return. No, my life is for God. I want to please him, and it is the will of God that I would be sanctified. You might ask the question, how does that happen? Jesus said in John 17, 17, Father, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. God does his work in us to continually set us apart unto God through one primary means, not the only one, but through the truth of his word. So as the truth of God's word comes to us today about the area of our sexuality, My prayer is that the truth of God will have its work in making us increasingly set apart for him. Now that comes into sharp contrast when you think about the church in Thessalonica. They were in a culture, and the culture in which the church in Thessalonica lived was an immoral culture. Paul was writing to them, about their life there. And you can imagine that when Paul was writing this letter, he was sitting in Corinth. And as he wrote in Corinth, he could have looked up over the hill outside of Corinth to the Acropolis, and there would have been a temple of Aphrodite. And Paul knew full well in Corinth while he was writing to the Thessalonians, there's all kinds of pagan, immoral, ritualistic worship that included very immoral practices. And as he wrote to Thessalonica, they had very similar practices as well. The entire culture of the Thessalonica church was one of immorality. It was constantly part of the fabric of the culture of the first century world in Greece, in Thessalonica, that infidelity and sexual immorality was rampant, not unlike our own day. It is in that context that Paul then continues in chapter 4 and verse 3, this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. That you abstain from sexual immorality. 
So as if the Thessalonians might have been having a conversation with him, let's read this chapter and then see how this conversation unfolded. This is the will of God for you, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger of all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. One preacher that I listened to um, described this as a probable conversation in which the Thessalonians may well have been asking questions and Paul answers it. Or perhaps Paul was assuming that one statement would lead to a question that would then lead to another. This is how it might have unfolded. Paul begins in verse 3, This is the will of God, your sanctification. And they might say, well, what is sanctification? And narrowly defined, Paul would say, it is that you abstain from sexual immorality. They might have in return said, how do you do that? How do you abstain in our culture from an immoral life? And Paul's answer, verse 4, um, learn how to control your own body in holiness and honor. Their question and response to that might have been, no one does that in our culture. To which the answer might be, verse 5, well, you don't live in the passions of your lust like those who don't know God. They might have said in reply, well, then it's a private matter between me and the Lord. But the answer would have been, uh, in reply, verse 6, no, you don't engage in sexual immorality without impacting other people, and so you don't transgress against your brother. You, you don't defraud or steal from your brother, as if when you have sexual immorality, you can't help but impact the other people in that circumstance. To which they might have said, I think in Paul's mind, well, I'm sure the Lord will forgive me if I mess up a little bit here. And then the next thing is, no, I'm warning you, the Lord is an avenger of these things. And he takes sexual sin seriously. And if you do not repent, you can be certain that you will experience the judgment of God. He is the avenger of these things. Then give it to me in one verse, Paul. What are you saying? It's verse 7. God has not called you to impurity, but to holiness. To which they might have replied, I think you're being a little too excessive on this, Paul. I think you're kind of hung up on sex. And then verse 8 replies, Well, therefore, who disregards this is not disregarding man, but God, who gives the Holy Spirit to you. Perhaps this conversation went in this way, at least as Paul was saying, I want to lay this out this way. So if we look at this, the will of God is a sexually pure life. We ought to perhaps take a moment and just describe a little bit of what we know the Bible is saying. Paul is saying you should abstain from sexual immorality. That's the word pornea. It is a general word that refers to all kinds of immoral behavior, anything that deviates from the revealed plan of God for human sexuality. 
And I understand that this may be a narrow view, but we understand that the only sexual relationship that is affirmed in the Bible is a loving relationship between a man and a woman in a monogamous marriage. I get that that's narrow, yet it is what the Bible has taught for 2,000 years. It's been the historic position of the church that the context in which sexual fulfillment takes place is in the context of marriage between a man and a woman. I might add at this moment that all of us want to be accepted, and we can accept people who disagree with that. Accepting someone and loving them are different things. Loving someone and affirming a different perspective is different. We all want to be loved, but we believe that accepting people who see things differently um, does not demand agreement. We can love people who differ. And yet, if we are the ones who are called out by God to be set apart, then we understand what God is saying here And we want it to be the way in which we would live because we belong to him. So we listen to what God is saying and we think about all of the ways in which perhaps we have failed in the area of sexual purity. And so we're listening careful to this. Why would this matter? Because we want to please the Lord. We want to be in the will of God. We want to be sexually pure, because that is the means by which sanctification happens in our life. And I I look at this text and I see several signals in a practical way of how this happens. First, number one, you'll see in verse two that the whole measure is to please God So if I want to please God and not just myself, then that's going to be an incentive in my life at least to think about not being susceptible to sexual temptation. God is the one I want to please. It is the will of God for me. It's what God wants. We would never say, well, I wonder if God wants me to have a sexual relationship outside of marriage. We wouldn't have to ask that because it's clearly stated here. There are several things in the Bible that are just clearly stated that this is the will of God for you and none more clear than this. This is what God desires for our life because we belong to him. I've often told people that if you wanna know what the will of God for your life is in all of the areas of your life, which the Bible doesn't talk about, where to go to school, what job to take, what house to live in, what neighborhood to live in, who should you marry? You can't find a verse in the Bible that will describe that. But if you will commit yourself to doing what you know the will of God is in all of the things that he has revealed, God will lead you in the areas of your life that the Bible doesn't speak to. So to begin... How can I keep my way pure? It's going to be that I say my mission in life is to please God and to glorify him. I want to do his will, which is to be set apart for for him. You'll notice in verse five that there is a signal that I don't live my life anymore like I used to before, like those who don't know God. Do you see that phrase in verse five? We don't live in the passions of our lust as those who do not know who God is. That is a signal for spiritual victory over sexual temptation. What is that? The key, a key, is saying in my heart, I want to know who God is. And the more I know God, the more resolve will be in my heart to stand strong against this kind of a temptation. Knowing God is a fortification against sexual temptation. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, Paul said, flee youthful lusts 
and pursue righteousness, faith, hope, and peace with those who call upon the Lord out of a pure heart. A resolve against sexual temptation is the pursuit of something else, righteousness, faith, hope, and peace. And the more we pursue those things, the more we pursue God, the more strong will be our resolve against other things. An ancient preacher said one time that that's the expulsive power of a new affection. Loving God, knowing God, is a fortification against the temptations that used to be mine. I'm listening to the questions that perhaps the Thessalonians asked. How does anyone do that? Having lived in a culture that was so immersed in sexual immorality, it was just a normal anticipation that infidelity and impropriety would be part of life. When they came to Christ, Paul was calling them, to a new kind of life. How? One way is to say, my life is to please God. I know that's his desire for me. One of the fortifications will be to know him increasingly and his word as well. Thy word have I hid in my heart. What? That I might not sin against God. I know God. I know his word. It is a fortification that's found right in the text. And then verse 7, the purpose of my life. God has not called me for impurity, but for holiness. It's, It's the call of God that I would be set apart in a distinct kind of a life. And then the concluding, I I think, strength for us is in verse 8. He gives his Holy Spirit to us. You and I, who have trusted in Christ, have received the Holy Spirit. When Paul was writing to the Roman church, he said, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, whom you have from God? You are not your own, therefore glorify God in your body. I think when the Thessalonians heard Paul give these words of instruction, they were understanding that the call of God on a Christian's life, when God says to them, you're mine, is to understand that that is the progressive work God wants to do in our life. So I'm not sure where you are today. In this category of your spiritual life, your personal life, But once we read the scripture, we understand that God wants to increasingly bring us along in holiness and away from sexual immorality and temptation. I want to give a word to you today if you're in a pile of guilt of failure. God's calling you to step forward and say, I now see the purpose of my life. And will you notice the phrases that are repeated several times at the end of this section? I want you to increase more and more and more. And the trajectory of the Christian life is never a a high ascending trajectory where we just continue to go. It's more like an up and down trajectory where the movement of our life is increasingly toward him. I love to play golf. A couple weeks ago, I played golf with a golf professional. And when I was playing with him, I had several moments in the round in which I thought to myself, what am I doing out here? I don't belong out here. But he was gentle and kind and actually gave some tips and instructions, which eventually I hope will help my golf game. But it was awesome to see someone play a game of golf as it's supposed to be played. And I want to get better. I asked him, I said, "Um, you you know, I I don't know how I can be out here. He just said, we're all getting better. I have things I'm working on and you do too. And that's absolutely true in our life. We're at different stages of spiritual development. But once the word of God like this grabs our attention, we do pay attention. We say, if this is the will of God, if this 
is what pleases him, then I want to know him. I want to set the direction of my life to be under his control here. Finally, brothers, I ask you, I urge you to walk in a manner to please God. It's interesting that the very first category of life he spoke to was their sexual life. So we're listening to that in our culture, and we want that to be true of us as well. Again, as chapter 5, verse 23 reminds us, the God of peace will sanctify us completely, and our whole spirit, and soul, and body to be blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus. He who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. If you've lost hope about this area of your life, I want you to know that God is committed to your holiness, and he calls us to be similarly committed to our holiness. That's what I want to pray that God will help us do today. Let's bow our heads. God, as we listen to this word today, our hearts are drawn to want to do what you call for us. And I pray for anyone who today feels the weight of prior failures, that the grace of God will be poured out to them right where they are today. And that by your Holy Spirit, for all who know Jesus, you will strongly call us to sanctification, to be separated apart from a life and a world that holds a different standard. I pray that holiness of life would be what you increasingly call us to. Assure us of your forgiveness through Christ, who paid it all. And call us, God, I pray, to know you more, to follow you more, to walk in a way that pleases you. We want our lives to bring you praise and glory. And we ask you to do this in our lives because we know it will result in our joy. It will result in the pleasure of God on our life. And so I ask that you will do it. In the name of Jesus, we all pray. And everybody said, amen. I've carried a burden for too long on my own. I wasn't created. To bear it alone I hear your invitation To let it all go And I see it now I'm laying it down And I know that I need you I'll run to the Father Fall into grace I'm done Surgeon, my soul needs a friend, so I run to the Father again and again and again and again. Oh, you saw my condition, had a plan from the start. Son for redemption 
Aren't you thankful that God is merciful, that he loves us as we are and would never think of leaving us where we are? Faithful is he who called you. He's going to bring to pass our growth in the likeness of Christ, our sanctification. God's going to do that for his glory. Let's join him in that and live our lives for his pleasure. God, I pray this week that you will bless us with the grace we need to be faithful to you, to walk with you in a way that pleases you, to truly walk in your will. May your grace and peace be on us all, I pray in Jesus' name, amen.